So today um, we're pleased to welcome uh, Claire Cope, um, who's the director of the Center for Water and the Minerals Industry. Um, so Claire's a recognized expert in mine water and environmental management, and, uh, and, and she's really focused on applying her technical and academic knowledge to achieving step changes in, in environmental performance of mining operations. Um, she's had a large number of research and consulting roles, including extensive experience with Anglo American, applying her technical expertise to environment and water, uh, working both in Australia and Canada, which I think from an environmental point of view are, are at opposite ends of the water spectrum, perhaps. Um, her current role at the SMI, which um, I've added to her bio to say it's her second stint at the SMI. It is. The first one from 2005 to 2010. Um, this current one started much more recently as the director of the Center for Water and Minerals Industry. She's focused on uh, bringing environmental excellence throughout the mining cycle, including both capacity building and research in water, environmental management, closure, and, uh, and, and post-mining uh, uh, post uh, amelioration, if you like. And, uh, and she's going to be talking today about mine site environmental management. So thanks very much, Claire. Thank you very much, Rick. And thank you for all the effort in organizing all these seminars. Uh, it's been wonderful to have access to uh, all these speakers and information. So the topic of my talk today is a little bit different and thank you everybody for joining us. I'm not going to talk much about research, which is very unusual for an SMI talk. I will point out some research opportunities as I go along, if I remember. But what I want to do today is provide the broad context of what man site and environmental management is. At SMI, we really focus on being, yes, we do research, but we are also integrator of knowledge. And environment is one of those aspects where if you understand the broad environmental context, and everybody's aware of it, what mine sites have to deal with, then we can add more value to our work and, and promote altogether this in improvement potentially in environmental performance. So just having an understanding of, of what it's about and what the environmental teams do. Um, sorry, I just, I just so environmental management, um, the reason for doing this talk today, it covers a lot of topics. It's really, really big, but we've seen big changes in the last five of ten year, five and ten years, five to ten years, with increases in technical complexities. So what an environmental what environmental teams were doing ten years is not what they are expected to do now. Um, and there's an issues around there are lots of issues around technical support and how they address those increase in complexity. My talk today has a strong focus on Australia and there are reasons for this. That's where we have seen a lot of the changes in the last five, 10 years, particularly water, a lot of improvement. Uh, the way we're looking at water 10 years, 10 years ago is not the way we look at it now. And there's been lots of improvements in data, in data management aspect, et cetera. So it's changed the water aspect quite a lot. Rehabilitation and closure, you would all be aware we've had legislative changes, uh, particularly in Queensland, and that is changing a lot of the ways we are looking at rehabilitation and closure with a lot of activities in that space. Uh, tailings, water quality, salinity, that remains a core activity of, of the mine industry. Um, not a lot of changes specifically on legislation, but still a lot of activities. Uh, what I won't be talking about too much today is everything around dust, noise and vibration. And the reason is it's very site specific. Uh, it is driven by the presence or not of sensitive receptors. So it is a bit difficult to talk about this in general terms. It is something a mine has to address respective to their own risk. We have seen a lot of improvement in <clears throat> instruments, particularly with the noise and the dust. And there's a lot more automation of those sort of monitoring devices. So that's where the improvements are. It's not something I'll be talking about um, in a lot of detail today, but when visiting an operation, working with a specific operation, it's good to be aware of these specific issues around dust and noise and how they might uh, interfere with your own work. There are other aspects of um, environmental management. Some I will talk about um, a few words around biodiversity and green, greenhouse gas emissions. All the talks around waste and circular economy, we've had a lot of SMI um, seminars about this, uh, Glenn Corder, Art and Golev have, have given seminars. So I won't revisit this in detail today. Cultural heritage is an interesting one. 
Sarah Holcomb gave a fantastic seminar on cultural heritage recently as part of the SMI series, where she clearly outlined all the complexities around cultural heritage and the amount of work and commitment it required. Now, unfortunately, in Australia, a lot of the minds very often is that responsibility falls back on the environmental team. And some of them do fantastic work. They are committed, they're taking on, they do everything they're supposed to do, but re realistically, they are not trained for it. So it is an additional responsibility on them that probably they shouldn't have. So the, it needs a bit of thinking around how we uh, assign responsibility for this. Uh, after listening to Sarah, it's quite obvious the environmental team, they shouldn't be responsible for this just because they don't have the training and, and the ability. Uh, and having said that, some of them do fantastic work. Um, with environments, one of the issues, there's always this legal and regulatory context around it, and that will change from country to country, from state to state. So I, I'm not going to give a lecture on, on environmental law today. Um, I think the general message is any mine will be operating under a range of regulatory frameworks, and it is important to understand what these are. Um, they can change from, I and mean, each country will have their own acts and, and frameworks. Um, and it, even within the country, you've got legislation at the federal level, at the state level, in Canada, it's the province. So understanding that uh, context is really important because it will drive what the environmental team will be doing. Um, the, there is an ex extensive approval regime. So if you want to start a new mine, you're preparing for a new mine, you have to go through these approval processes and most of the time it will take the form of an environmental impact study. And these are extensive, it's years of work and they produce an enormous amount of reports and models. Um, and all of these are in the public domain. So it's a mine of information pun intended. So you can Google anything, you will find EIS reports online, it's freely available. And I've tried to put a lot of pictures in that presentation and all of them are found online in EIS. Almost all of the technical work you will find through EIS. And a relatively new mine, all the hydrological models, all the models they have, they would have been done initially at the EIS stage and then they keep the model and they keep improving them as they go. The mines are a bit older, then it'll be different. Not quite sure where the initial models were done, whether they were done at all, and then I have to start from scratch. But a lot of the initial work is done at the stage of the EIS. Um, operational regimes then will vary. A mine will have a range of permits, licenses. Here in Queensland, we call them environmental authorities. That is the key document for a mine in Queensland. The environmental team needs to know what we call the EA, back to front, front to back. There's also external internal standards, either for the industry at large, ICMM produces a range of documents. Each company has their own internal standards very often, so they need to comply with those as well. That means the mine now operates with hundreds of conditions. We really are in the hundreds now, and it's producing quite a lot of work in the field of compliance management software. When you've got hundreds of obligations um, and you need to track compliance with them and, and for auditing purposes, et cetera, your Outlook calendar is not gonna cut it. So like you really need specific tools. And about half of these obligations will be related to data. So you have to measure this. If the number is greater than that, you have to do this. You, you need specific tools to do that. And there's been an increase in activity in the development of this compliance software. It's looking really, really good now um, with a lot of automation of, of cross-checking your compliance with, um, with obligations. And then the last stage, of course, once you're through your operational regime is closure and relinquishment. And we've seen quite a lot of legislative changes in that, in that space. So much so that now we have a CRC for transitioning and mining economies. So there's going to be a lot of activities, particularly in the research institutes like SMI on closure and relinquishment. Now, of course, Having, having said all this on obligations, it remains a risk-based approach. Um, you, you will adapt the management level to your local risks. You know, if it never rains, you're not going to spend too much time doing water management. So it will change from, from your, with your local context, but compliance remains a key issue and it remains the bulk of the activities of an environmental team. And I've, I've talked about this, how they need tools to um, manage the compliance and tracking it. Now, I'll start with water. Now, water is my technical expertise, so I might spend a bit too much time on it compared to the other topic. I'll do my best. Um, it does cover, even just water covers a lot of activities because there's the water supply issues. So 
you need to secure import of water from external sources, there's contracts in place and all the infrastructure, do you have enough water for what you want to do, etc. There's all the work on hydrology. Uh, in Australia, it's very extensive, a lot of motoring of weather data and flow and local creeks, uh, a lot of catchment mapping and drainage, particularly with issues around erosion and sediment control, flood risks, um, understanding where the risks are and how we mitigate them. Water course diversion, I'm not going to talk about this today because it's too big. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of work through ACAP on how to design a water course diversion, how to monitor its performance, how to maintain it, and what to do at closure. It's very, very detailed technical guidelines, so good that they're actually part of the environmental authority. So the EA actually says you need to do water course diversion as described in all these ACAP uh, reports. It's a lot of work. It's very challenging in Queensland uh, due to the soil types and the tend to erode and gully erosion and all sorts of things. And, and maintaining good watercourse diversions is a lot of work and can keep an environmental team really, really busy, particularly on the monitoring and inspection regime. Uh, but it's very technical and just, just be aware that some mines spend a lot of time on watercourse diversions. There's all the aspects around what I call water quantity, which is basically your water balance. Uh, the water balance modeling, the water accounts, which is just a fancy word for system level, high level water balance and SMI obviously has been absolutely instrumental in influencing this. And all the work in the last 10 years improving water balance um, reporting and modeling is thanks to all the work SMI has done. And amazing what can happen when you implement the outcome of research, a huge improvement. Uh, there's a lot of work on water quality. So we, yes, there's, there's uh, salinity issues, acid mine drainage, all things we are all familiar with in mining. Um, and, and there's also a lot of monitoring, a lot of data acquisition in the receiving environment and trying to assess any potential impacts of mining activities on the receiving environment. Again, that keeps them really busy. Um, hydrology and flood forecasting now, um, because water tends to flow downhill, um, it starts with a spatial analysis of topography. It's changed a lot in the last 20 years. I mean, gone's at the day where, you know, we draw contours by hand on a map. Uh, we've got amazing data sets now uh, with a lot of, um, we get the LIDAR information. We can get really, really precise topography and do all that work automatically with amazing computing system, et cetera, et cetera. Now, not all mines, everywhere in the world have access to that amazing data. Um, we are doing a project in New Caledonia at the moment. So actually a lot of mines don't have the LIDAR data set. And they say, yes, Claire, because the plane has to come from Australia, so we can't do it. It costs too much money at the moment. No one can fly anyway. So I didn't realize this. Um, Australia is a bit of a hub for these sort of technologies. They were developed here and this, we seem to think it's easy to get you to get the plane and that's fine. But in other regions of the world, it might not be that easy. Just a broad comment here, and I know it's a bit general, um, what I find with mining companies, they do not invest enough in their strategy for the management of geospatial data. So the environmental team will have the uh, GIS software, they know how to do it, they fiddle a bit, they don't get much technical support at all. It's not like they have, a lot of business units don't have, you know, the GIS specialist that can help you with all your GIS needs and they have to do it themselves. Uh, and there's a lack of integration between the various departments. I don't want to be too general because I'm sure comp there'd be companies or mines that do that super well. But as a, as a general observation, we, with the improvement in technology, it's, it's time to invest a bit more in those aspects. Now, in Australia, we can whip up a hydrological model with our eyes closed. Um, we, we've done it for years. We know how to do it. And, and I think the main reason we've, we've got fantastic technical guidelines. So the main one is Australian rainfall and runoff. It's the book about that big. It's got everything you want to know about estimating rainfall. Um, we're very good at this. Uh, very, very good at this. Um, a lot of the consultants are excellent. Uh, there's a lot of technical expertise. Providing there's good data with which to validate and calibrate a model, there's no great difficulty. And, and Australian rainfall and runoff gets reviewed regularly so that some of the climate change impact on rainfall are embedded in the estimation uh, method. So it's, we are very lucky to have this. I've never been I have never seen, and I'm happy to stand corrected on this, but I've never seen an equivalent of Australian rainfall and runoff anywhere else in the world. So the, the technical guidelines are a lot more spread out and, and less, I don't want to say stringent, but you know, here you've got to use it. If you do a hydrological model with, without referring to it, it won't be accepted. Uh, having said that, we have a little idiosyncrasies here. We use a model, we tend to use a model called WARB, 
uh, which is the Strand model um, in Fortran. And a couple up to a few years ago, we're still writing input files in Fortran. I think they've got a graphical user interface now. Um, it's a great model, we love it. Um, I'm not quite sure why we're so wedded to it. Uh, other countries, they will rely more on the tools coming out of Holland, the Mike Xi tool, suite of tools, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of role modeling happening here. And I guess, you know, you start with this and then you lend it to another mine and they'll pick it up and then make it bigger. And then it just snowballs and everybody's got a role model at the end. Um, so we've got a bit of a niche expertise with this particular model here. Uh, why would you do this? A lot of it is flood uh, management, uh, identifying flood risk. There is regulation in Queensland around flood protection. So you must protect your pit from floods. Um, it is in your environmental authority. So you must have a model. You must show your, your pit is protected against a range of, of floods. Um, emergency action plan as well. Some mines have high risk structures and they need to have emergency action plan in place. So you, you need to show uh, the modeling. This is just an example for a dam around Middle Mount um, and the basis for the emergency action plan. Now, water balance. So um, what we did 10 years ago at SMI is propose that mines report their water in terms of a high level water balance. How much water uh, do you have coming into your system from what source and at what quality? And where do you lose it? Where does it go? There's a bit is lost. You might release to the environment, but essentially it goes to your product that is then exported it evaporates and it goes into tailings. Just high level so we understand what comes in, what goes out. The bit in the middle, you know, the demands for the rarest task is not actually entirely that relevant to the broad picture of what your water balance looks like. Um, and then we get into all these discussions around water use. So uh, it, it's frustrating because in all these boxes, can you tell me what water use is? And everybody can have a different opinion about this. I have mine. Uh, which I think is the water use really is how much water are you bringing from outside the high quality, high cost water that you're taking away from other users and catchment. To me, that is a critical aspect because the others, groundwater, the entrained moisture, the rainfall and runoff, there's nothing you can do to control it. Um, you don't control the weather. You've got to manage it, but there's not much, you, you're not going to control this. If you are doing any efficiency work, doing more reuse and recycling, what's going to happen is you've got to impact, oops, you've got an impact on, on your um, contract water. ICMM produced a document recently or a year or two ago where they were actually saying, oh no, water use should be these outputs. They should be the product moisture, the entrainment in the tailings and the evaporation. I said, well, if it's evaporation then you have to take into, into account rainfall and runoff because that's where the water is coming from in the first place. It gets really messy. People are getting into those complex discussions about what water use should be. And why don't we just report the water count? And then we know exactly what we are talking about. And we know what to focus on, which is reducing uh, the import of high quality water from external sources. And really that's at a corporate level, uh, uh, in the general public discussion, that really is the number we should be focusing on. Um, typically the environmental team will do that monthly. Um, some minds there might be a bit of a case to do it weekly, but it's, it's hardly ever the case. Um, and then reconcile all the numbers every year. Um, with water, we tend to work with water year rather than, than calendar year because we follow the peaks and troughs of, of rainfall and runoff. But very importantly, um, this is volume, right? So we report volume, yearly volume, not cubic meters per second, like they love doing in Chile. And the reason they love doing it is because it hides just the magnitude of the volume of water they import. So. These numbers are from BHP Water Report, published in 2018. BHP were the first one to implement the water accounting framework. They did it from day one and they did it everywhere at every operation. So they now have this amazing data set. They've got 10 years of water balance information for all their operations and they can produce these amazing graphs, summaries of all their data. They've done fantastic work. Um, Escondida in Chile imports four or five times more water than pretty much the entire coal sector in Australia. So yes, the water demand, the extraction of water in, in the, those copper mines in Chile are gigantic. Really, it's, it's orders of magnitude difference. So there's a lot of talk around water use in mining, mining uses a lot of water. Really, we are referring to these specific cases of, of copper mines in Chile. I, I've never seen these numbers you never see anywhere else, right? And, and you know, you know how big BMA here, who, they're huge. So, and if you look at those numbers, it's, it's a little bit scary. Um, 
So that's why they give you the numbers in cubic meters per second because it's not quite as obvious then. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in Chile on, on water uh, intensity and, and extraction of water from catchments. Obviously, Escondida put a lot of effort into relying more on seawater, um, desalinated seawater, and there is a, a lot of activities in Chile around desalination just to meet those, those requirements. Um, now that we've got, so what happened with the implementation of the water accounting framework? Um, we've got good data, so we can develop good water detail, water balance models. So these will support the development of water balance model where we have all the complexities and the daily variations and the pit water level on a daily basis, et cetera. And they become better and better calibrated because of all the water balance reporting that happens now. And we can look a lot of activities recently on the post-closure water balance. And we're looking at using our models and running all sorts of scenarios, what will impact on your post-closure water balance. Uh, and the answer is evaporation, really. So that's the conclusion we reached. Um, the assumptions we put in our model around evaporation, and there are a lot of uncertainties with this, will make a huge difference on your final void water level, which means it impacts on how much rehabilitation you have to do, it impacts on costs, et cetera. So at SMI at the moment, we're heavily focused on improving evaporation calculations in water balance models. Uh, Professor Neil McIntyre from SWIMI is working at developing an ARC linkage. Uh, we're only just starting on how we're going to address this. Um, other impacts are, you know, around the management of catchments and how you design your catchment to get the uh, closer to the answer that you want. Um, but really, evaporation is the key one. That work is done. Um, to predict water quality as well. And the issue here is getting data, the material characterization. So the quality of the runoff that's gonna come out of spawn basically into the void, that's becoming really, really critical. The models are super conservative because we don't have much data. So this is why Mensoe Draki at CMLR, he's set up a leaching facility at Pinjara Hills. And that's exactly to address this. So we're gonna get a lot more data, long-term data that we can fit into these models. So what I actually know your post Closure water quality is not going to be 100, and it's not going to be an electrical quantity of 100,000 microsiemens per centimeter, it's going to be much lower. And there's, there's heaps of uncertainty, and with the assumptions we put in the model, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And we, we really don't think this is a good representation of what's going to happen. So, that that's work Mensa was doing is of critical importance to all the post closure water quality assessments. Um, Water quality more broadly is, is a lot of the environmental is worried or they have to uh, monitor for any potential impact of mining activities on the receiving environment. So they will, be, they will have extensive networks of monitoring equipment in the creeks where they measure flow, um, take samples, send them to the lab, analyze for metals and all sorts of um, analytes. Uh, but what's been happening in Queensland is really interesting is that everybody's compiled that data and everybody gives it to the uh, Fitzroy Partnership for River Health and they produce a water quality report cards for the whole catchment. So what we've seen the last 10 years is more data, investment in database, database talking to each other, and then we can produce those catchment based um, results. So it's, it's a fantastic initiative. It's unique. I think it is really one of the best uh, mining-led catchment basin initiative we have in the world. Um, fantastic work. And we're trying to export it. So a lot of the work I do, when I talk to other countries and we're starting to look at this, a lot of it is exporting some of the best practice and some of the things we've developed here and that we know have produced really good results. Um, now, there are other water-related topics. It gets more and more uh, technical as we go. There's a lot of work on erosion and sediment control at the moment. So, and we have an ECAP project uh, to develop a, a, a framework for Queensland mines. At the moment, everybody's doing it a bit differently and we're trying to bring a bit of um, consistency to, to that aspect. I haven't talked much about groundwater. So hydrogeology and groundwater, there's two, there's two aspects to it. If a mine operates under the water table, if the water table causes any threat to mine operations, they will throw money at it. And it will not be with the environmental team. It will be someone in technical services that have a large team of hydrogeologists dealing with this. And they have pumps and they have pipelines and it becomes an infrastructure issue with monitoring, of course. And, and then they have large teams to do this. Um, so again, risk-based, it really depends on your local context. 
Um, the regions of the world where they have fantastic hydrogeological skills is Chile because they do a lot of a, extracting groundwater for production and, and dealing with slope stability issues and all sorts of things. The Pilbara has really, really good um, skill set in hydrogeology as well. Um, if it's not impacting on production, really the, the environmental side of groundwater is around uh, monitoring impact on aquifers. So is there any water seeping out of the mine into the groundwater? So we're back to monitoring network, collecting data, analyzing it, storing it in the database, etc. Uh, groundwater modeling is, is more and more widespread now. So a lot of mines, if not most, will have a groundwater model for their local area. Um, there's a lot of complexities in the groundwater modeling and the issue we have now is how do we integrate with the surface water models? So particularly for the post-closure water balance. So what are the groundwater inputs into that post-closure water balance is getting quite complex and we're looking at a range of projects to uh, look at this in more detail. There's something very, another aspect that's very specific to long wall coal mines. Uh, so New South Wales and Queensland is around subs subsidence. Uh, the, the long walls, um, the ground will collapse, will subside, and then you have change to topography. You're creating areas that do not drain. What does that mean for the environment, for the regional ecosystem? What are you going to do to rehabilitate? Is it, are you better off leaving the water there, or um, are you better off the conditions ask you to reestablish a free draining? Then form is a good thing to do when you've got highly erosive soils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there's also it can impact on water course. Uh, so the Isaac River around Moranbai is the perfect example. There's been amazing work done on the cumulative impact of subsidence on the Isaac River. There are consultants that specialize in this. Uh, their detailed geomorphology, hydrological study, it's impressive. Uh, so there's, there are pockets of technical excellence in Queensland or New South Wales just because we've had to address some specific aspects and it, it is very impressive what they can achieve. So just good to be aware of, of the work that happens in the broader um, catchment. Now, the next topic, rejects and tailings, this is a tricky one because it's an aspect where everything gets integrated. So all the work that happens on a mine site, the various teams and what they do, uh, so everybody's involved in it, but doing different pockets or looking at different aspects of those management. So. Typically, the processing plant, if they're trying to do something more clever with tailings, um, it will impact on future opportunities. So whatever you've done now is done, but we're looking towards the future. What can we do to improve? What can we do to reduce water content in tailing? What can we do to, to produce waste that is less difficult to manage? Um, the social aspects, uh, there's been a lot of involvement, especially at SMI, around all those international initiatives around tailings. Uh, looking at governance processes and improving this. So there's a bit of an overlap with environment, but it's not huge. This, where everything should come together really on the life of mine disposal strategy. So all these departments should talk to each other about, you know, what is the 20, 30 year plan for disposal tellings? Where are we gonna put them? Um, do we have a plan for this? So that's where all the social processing environment aspects should come together. From just specifically the environment perspective, it's strongly related to water uh, because water and tailings really from a legislative point of view, there's no real difference. And managing the legacy. So the tailings that have been produced in the last 10, 20, 30 years, whatever it is, what do we do with them? What risks do they cause? How do we close the telling storage facilities, etc.? So that's why they focus on. So they're not really that much involved or shouldn't be in the whatever the future plans are, but they, they also have to deal with what's being produced um, and how to deal with it now. Uh, the, <clears throat> so let's look at this. So life of mine disposal strategy is very important, um, particularly those Queensland, the, the, the large coal mines, not necessarily Queensland with lots of pits. There's, we actually got to a stage where there's very few telling stands in Queensland, New South Wales, and, and preferring in pit disposal if you've got a pit, of course. Um, the undergrounds also have co-disposal areas, and, and that's where we need to start looking at collaboration between various companies and various mines to try and, you know, if there's an empty pit somewhere and I've got a massive co-disposal area, maybe we should look at something doing better there. Um, so this really should be a, an exercise for the whole mine on deciding where to put your tellings and what the options are, particularly around water content and reducing that, because uh, it does make it easier to close. A telling storage facility is much easier to close if it doesn't have too much water in it, otherwise it's a bit tough. Whatever you do, it is strongly linked with the mine water system. 
it, it can't be divorced from it. Um, and the mind water balance model is the tool that is used to support this life of mind disposal strategy. So whatever decision or scenario you have, you need to run it through the mind site water balance model to figure out what the impact is going to be on water. Do you have enough containment? Do you have enough freeboard, etc.? So there's a lot of work on this. And associated with this is the concept of regulated structures. So the term will change, companies, standards will use different words, but it's the same thing. It's whatever structure you have where you, where you store either water or tailings. And from the legal perspective in most jurisdiction, it doesn't matter which one it is. Uh, they very much treat tailings as malaffected water. Um, and then you assess the risk associated with those structures. What are risks? What are the risks in terms of not containing what they have, uh, either to the groundwater through seepage or overtopping <clears throat> if it rains a lot and they start uh, spilling water over the edge? Um, and then the dam break, of course, for the ones who do have tailings dam. There's been an enormous amount of work in the last 10 years in Queensland. Um, in the calculation method to figure out how much freeboard do you need to have. So 10 years ago, they came up with a very simple calculation method and then the industry was looking at millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of upgrades to all their storage facilities because they were too small and could not provide the freeboard. Now, parallel to this, of course, we implemented the, uh, the water counting framework was implemented, the water balance models were improved. So well, why don't we use the water balance model to calculate those numbers? And of course, the numbers were quite different. Um, Saves the industry, well, they ended up not having to upgrade much, if anything, by just implementing a water accounting framework, really. So it's impressive. Um, having said that, it is becoming super complex. So there's, there's the wet season runoff containment, which is captured by what they call design storage allowance. And there's the containment of the intense short storms, which is captured with the mandatory reporting levels. Yes, you can use the water balance model to calculate all these things, but it's super complex. So we now have environmental teams that need to understand this and be able to explain it. Um, and it is super complicated and they need resources to run the models and calibrate them, et cetera. So what we've gained in not having to upgrade structures, we've lost in increased complexity and resources to manage that complexity. Uh, and I think that really is a key message. Um, and the way, what, what they end up doing is they really have to report, you know, how much water in each inventory, how does it compare to the DSA MRL levels and track that continuously and feedback to the models. There's a lot of work going in this. Um, so also think there's a lot of work on the water balance specifically for telling storage facilities. And then we get, it's away from that daily water balance modeling activities into uh, a, lot, a lot of detailed technical work, bringing the soil science, the material characterization, hydric properties, geochemical properties, a very specialized software. So eventually the numbers feed back into the water balance model, but they are standalone pieces of work uh, looking at specifically the water balance in a, in a TSF. And, you know, the environmental team will rely on consultants. Uh, you know, they will, at this degree of specialization, you, you will go and get, you will contract um, specialized teams, but they still have to manage them, provide the data, do the field work with them, et cetera. So, is still a lot of work for them. Now, closing a telling storage facility, um, there's uh, as quickly as we can, hopefully, um, that, that would be the recommendation. Um, it is linked with the course reject disposal at some of the mines as well, and you do all your layers and, and all your assessment of what's required. Um, you know what the objectives are. We want to control any risk of failure to contain. Uh, obviously, we don't want any tellings going anywhere. Uh, minimizing the export of contaminants to the receiving environment and, and trying to create a stable surface cover that is suitable for um, vegetation. So again, they will go to specialized uh, consultants to do that, but then the field work, the construction work can be uh, challenging, particularly around drainage. So um, you know, they can be quite large and you have to manage your drainage as you go. So you need to have very, very specific, super precise topographic plan um, when you are doing your landform reshaping to make sure you don't create any water or contaminant issues. And once it's done, you put in place a large monitoring network, particularly around groundwater and monitoring, et cetera. So a mine that is has a project in a year to close a telling storage facility, just maybe don't ask them for too much because they will be quite busy. Um, 
won't talk about acid-mine drainage because you know I'm sure you've heard about it. Um, and there are a lot of um, is a lot of resources out there on acid-mine drainage. Context mine specific, context specific depends on the region. Um, a lot of specialized geochemical uh, consultancy services to help uh, a lot of options for treatments, but we haven't quite. I still think we haven't quite cracked it. So people still have issues trying to identify the best solutions and and the communication around what is super effective is probably not quite there yet. So there's still a lot of a lot of trying to find what the best thing is like we can do to um, manage it. Um, and but the techniques are well established around uh, getting data, assessing the potential for acid generation, doing the test. Um, and optimizing waste rock placements. So a lot of improvements can be achieved with something as simple as this. So having a, a good plan for how you're going to be disposing of the waste rock and following it. Um, and any, we, we do see when, when the plan is not followed quite as well as it could be, we start seeing impacted on metal leaching or acid mine drainage. So it does help uh, have doing all those characterization and following the plan can make a big difference. Now, rehabilitation and closure. So not much in terms of the techniques to do rehabilitation. So the landform, first you do your landform reshaping to reestablish some slopes that can sustain some sort of post-mining land use. You reconstruct a soil profile and there are technical issues there. A lot of topsoil deficiencies. What material do we have? What can we do to that material to create something that looks like a topsoil? And long been um, at CMLR does piles of that work on the red muds. You know, how do I turn this into soil, something that's functional? Um, then selecting suitable vegetation species, establishing them, doing the monitoring, does it work, does it not? Uh, and ideally for our recolonization. So this, there's always research in that space uh, because there's always something coming up. Uh, and more and more we're testing the resilience of the ecosystem we reestablish. But you know, it's, it's progressing pretty much as planned. What has changed in the last two, three years is the legal instruments that controls these activities. So it used to be, oh, you have a plan of operations, you may or may not decide to do rehab. Now you actually have to give a plan, a very precise plan of what you are expecting to do when. You need to have milestones, you need to meet those milestones. Uh, and you have to have timing. So now there's a document that describes exactly how you're gonna be doing rehab and you must stick with it and comply with it. So that's been the biggest change. It's a bit less, um, not sure what the word is, it's a bit more controlled. But in terms of the technical um, aspects, we know what they are and the research will keep going, um, getting your environmental baseline, what does it look like? Material characterization really is key. Um, it's key to a lot of things. It's key to a lot of those water quality predictions, but also in rehab, what is going to be the hydrological behavior of those uh, systems? What quality do we expect? How does water drain through them? How does water infiltrate, etc.? Um, at SMI, we have one of the last soil science labs in existence, um, and we are super um, fortunate that we can actually get all those data. So the hydraulic properties of, of soils, we can do that. So we have a lot of really good setup and it's proving super beneficial to any rehab study. Uh, landform design. Um, I'm not sure whether a lot of people at JK do that in the production centers, but I know we're not very strong at SMI on, on those aspects, but we are super strong, of course, on all the ecosystem restoration. So what comes next? Um, and and assisting minds as well with goal setting. What, what, what will your success criteria be? What is it going to look like? And what kind of performance indicators do you have? Now, how do you know it's successful? So, and a lot of work at CMLR on those aspects. Um, and Peter Erskine, Phil McKenna and his group, they, they're very focused at the moment on resilience of ecosystems. So yes, we've done all that work. Um, how resilient it is, can you cope with fire? Can you cope with a range of, of environmental risks? Um, and they're using very the new data, the new technologies to do this. A lot of capture of data through um, remote sensing. They fly drones, and they're getting really interesting data sets. So that's where a lot of the improvements are at the moment. But because they're doing all that work on resilience, uh, in some parts we find that it's actually not that resilient, and maybe we should look at doing something else, which is exactly what's happening at the moment. 
Um, we are starting two projects, one specifically around Moranba and the other for four, the four uh, mining regions of Queensland, looking at options for post-mining land use. So at the moment, uh, the team have conditions in environmental authority that they have to re-establish this vegetation or do this. And we're taking a step back and say, let's look at it broadly. What can we do? We've got those assets, we've got that infrastructure, mining companies want to collaborate, can we do something better on postminingland.com? So this is really exciting work. Um, and SMI is really excited to be contributing to this. Uh, biodiversity, so um, what's more and more they're looking at, a lot of companies have produced really good documents and strategies on biodiversity and looking at net positive impact. So there's a mine, um, you're having an impact on, on you're trying first to try and avoid impact on, on biodiversity, you know, can I, can I mine, can I just move something, move my infrastructure here rather than there so that it doesn't impact on these protected species, for instance. Uh, can we maintain corridors of natural vegetation to minimize the risk to biodiversity? So they do all that water, a lot of work, but they're now looking as, at improving it as well. So through biodiversity offsets and, and these sort of approaches. And some companies are quite aggressive with this and doing um, really interesting work, particularly uh, collaborating with NGOs, uh, Fauna and Flora International, these sort of NGOs, and, and when can we do, there's a lot of work, sorry, Nia, they're not looking at you. Um, they, they're really big with this in South Africa, and I'm sure there was a story recently with De Beers moving elephants around and trying to protect us, and there's always wonderful stories coming out of Africa. Australia's not quite as exciting. Um, and, and the most depressing thing probably in Australia is pest management, so it, it just breaks your heart. Um, and volatile teams spend a lot of time, particularly in Queensland, on managing pests, pigs, pigs and cats, um, pigs everywhere on rehab area. It's horrible. Um, I just, yeah, and it's we do have techniques, nothing really fancy, and it doesn't quite work either. It's very, very challenging. Um, nevertheless, um, they have really good strategies, and and this is something with post mining land use where we can have a bit of an impact as well, and trying to look at opportunities for some positive impacts on biodiversity. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, next. Uh, greenhouse gas management. So in Australia specifically, there are a lot of activities generally in the world on, on accounting for carbons. I'm not um, you're aware of this, but Australia has a framework, uh, a single national framework for the reporting of those emissions. Uh, we call it ENGES. Um, it is managed by the Clean Energy Regulator and, and ironically, this is a regulator that actually has teeth. So they're actually really strong and have a lot of power. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work in that space. What we report in Australia uh, through ENGES is scope one and scope two emissions. So the scope one is you produce electricity by burning coal, you report that, you burn diesel fuel, and fugitive emissions. So the one of it, you know, most coal mines in Queensland is the diesel, and it's the fugitive emissions. It's roughly half-half, um, more or less. And then the scope two emissions is the indirect consumption. So you purchase electricity through a company that produces it by burning coal, that's your scope two emissions. Scope three is the emissions that are embedded in the products and services that you purchase. We don't have to, um, we don't have to report those. The, for the scope one and the scope two, but most mines will be scope one. So the environmental team is responsible for collecting the numbers and reporting them to the regulators. So what that meant is they've invested heavily in database um, and then they engage broadly throughout the mine to capture. So they're not responsible for producing the numbers per se, but they are responsible for compiling them and reporting them. So uh, with gas drainage in underground coal mines, obviously there'll be big teams looking after gas, but the environmental team are the ones that have to produce all the numbers from gas drainage to um, report to engines. So that adds another layer of complexity to their work. Um, and talking about data, this is from BHP. So BHP is interesting because BHP actually uh, put a lot of effort into assessing the scope three emissions, but in their report, um, they may put scope one and scope two, just to give you an idea. So every mine, every company now will have really good systems to track scope one and scope two, um, and then produce a lot of reports. But just more generally, there has been such an increase in monitoring requirements and reporting requirements. We've seen a huge um, investment in database. 
so just be aware of that. The environmental team, they have a lot of information because they're mostly responsible for all those reporting requirements um, and they have it. And it's not just here, there's, and there's always something new, sorry. Um, just quickly, just, you know, we talked about water rehab and all the monitoring associated with this, but there's always new things coming up. So a big one is the National Pollutant Inventory. So um, where they have to account for every single other light they have that might just make its way to the environment. That's an enormous piece of work. It's so big, they actually have special software. There's one piece of software specifically to do National Pollutant Inventory. Um, and these two, three, four weeks of work every year for people on my site to collect that information. And then it gets fed into some government database and then you can access it. So I'm pretty sure it's on the public domain. Um, plus all the commitments from permits and licenses. Data management has become really, really um, a big part of their jobs. And I've just spent 50 minutes telling you about all the work they do. And typically an environmental team on a my site is two to four people. So they're busy very busy uh, honestly you've never seen i don't want to be too general but i've never seen an appropriately resourced environmental team and yes of course they'll engage with all the teams you know they'll talk to technical services they'll talk to gas drainage they don't do all the work themselves and they have access to consulting services but they still need to manage them and understand them and provide directions to those consulting uh, firm so it's becoming really really hard and, and very typically they have and they have a lot of data they've got everything um, so you need data start with the envirors they'll have it that's it that's good timing then yeah. thank you <laughs> okay. thanks very much Claire that was a fantastic talk it was really uh, really comprehensive coverage my apologies to those who I think missed the last one minute or so of the of the talk um, so we have some we have some questions from the Q&A um, so we might start. Uh, we might start with one from there. But what we'll do for the live questions is we'll just pass the microphone to whoever has it. What are the next? Um, what are the next research areas of interest for the Centre of Water in, in, the, in the coming years? So we've got a few. So there's we've got some very specific water technical aspects where you know getting really really technical so i talked about evaporation water balance model um it sounds simple it isn't um and it's a lot of math um and we've got the right people to work on that so a bit excited about this uh the surface water groundwater interactions and the cumulative impact of funnel voids on water resources is a big one so most mines we, we now have water balance model a post closure water balance model for the mines um, but if you look at Queensland and the number of voids, and they all, a lot of them will hold water, um, what does that mean for regional water resources? But more importantly, what can we achieve there that is more valuable than just having that water sitting in the pits doing not much? So what is the potential for water supply? What is the potential for diluting it with flood water? All sorts of things we are looking at. So catchment-based studies of uh, funnel void and cumulative impact of funnel void is going to be a big one. And ideally, we'd like to integrate surface water and groundwater as part of the studies, but that does raise a range of issues, um, technical issues. So that's one thing. But we also, water, we tend to, we don't just work on the specific technical uh, discipline areas. We also integrate with the rest of SMI on, on higher level issues, particularly the Center for Social Responsibility in Mining and, and CMLL, of course. Um, this is just looking at, at you know, post mining land use, resilient systems, etc. So we're always involved in those conversations. Um, and I've got a particular interest in, in, in risk and values uh, and the value of water as well. So building a business case for water improvement initiative can be really difficult because value, uh, because water doesn't cost much. In fact, um, we've just done a, a quick study for BHP looking at potential value from water savings, but savings of high quality external water and there's actually not much you can do um, depending on where you are in the catchment etc so we're just trying to change we've been talking about this for a long time but just trying to find ways to better
quantify the, the value of water and so that we can build some good business case for water improvement initiatives. Okay, thanks, Claire. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I guess my question is about um, multiple mine sites and about the degree to which they consider the impacts of other mine sites. So say you've got a stress catchment to one mine site, their environmental impact. What degree are they considering what the other mine is doing and potentially, you know, if they did similar things together, they'd get better environmental outcomes or if they did opposite things, you'd get worse environmental outcomes, although maybe individually they look reasonable. So they've actually been really good um, with sharing of information. So the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health um, is, was mainly, you know, there was a lot of input from the mining industry, a lot of data sharing. They're also very good um, at sharing models, um, at establishing data sharing agreements and sharing of models. So you've got a mine, you're doing an EIS for an extension, you know, the mine next door has done the model, you ask them, do you mind giving, you, giving us your model? We'll improve it, we'll add to it, we'll send it back. So this happens a lot um, and it just goes both ways. Um, so this thing, it happens. Um, Cumulative impacts is a bit tricky. It is a requirement of the EIS, environmental impact studies, is to look at cumulative impacts uh, of, so you've got, you're proposing an extension. So yes, you can assess the risk of the extension itself, but adding this layer to what's already existing, what does that mean? And that's a lot harder because it, needs, it means you need to have access to all the information, which is why there was a project led by the government on bioregional assessment where they try and give you the context for assessing all those cumulative impacts. And the water trigger as well was another regulatory instrument that was introduced. Um, if you're a coal mine, uh, if you're proposing a new coal mine or a new whatever else it is, you need to look, it can trigger some specific water studies and that was very much to um, look at cumulative impact. And SMI was heavily involved in the development of this framework for cumulative impact assessment. CSRM and SWIMI did a lot of that groundwork and it's published, so the methodologies are out there. But for a consultant working on an EIS that needs to take into account cumulative impact, it can be a bit difficult just to access the information that they need to do that. But it's very much covered by the EIS process, or should be anyway. Yeah. Okay, I can see we've only got a couple of minutes left and we've got a huge number of questions in here. So you might be answering some afterwards, but there's a good one here, I think. Um, the in, in a site with potential climate change impacts, like increase in frequency of extreme events, um, affecting land restoration, surface cover, vegetation, et cetera, what strategies could be used in the closure design to address that climate related risk? I'm glad for the question because I forgot to mention it when someone asked what swimming was going to be doing in the next couple of years. This is what we're going to be doing in the next couple of years. So uh, Neil McIntyre has just, um, he's just done a review for BHP actually um, on climate change modeling now and how that we can use that in all the water balance work we do at mine sites, so we're going to do a bit more work on this. In fact, the proposal going to the CRC on exactly that topic. Um, and yes, so this is something we're going to grab with both hands and looking at design criteria, mitigation uh, strategies, change to water balance assessment, etc. with climate change. We are very fortunate in Australia, we have really, again, there's really good um, government directions, technical guidelines, information, so we actually make really good progress on this. Contact us if you want to know more. We are very involved in this topic. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions from the audience? If not, then there's, I think we've got time for just probably one more. Um, and I think this is a good one as well. Do you envisage a national framework for reporting water use, balance and chemistry, et cetera, in the future, similar to the NGER? I'd like, well, listen, the water accounting framework honestly has achieved that. Um, so we don't talk about water use, we just talk about water balance. Uh, listen, most major companies have implemented it. We, we are getting really good data now just through the water accounting framework. And I think people just need to stop worrying about uh, water use and just look at the numbers and, and use the numbers to bring improvement to their mind site. Water quality though, that's gonna be a lot harder. Uh, I don't think we've reached that stage at all. I'm not sure we're having conversations about it either. But the quantity, I think, you know, is progressed really well. Great. All right. Well, um, it's past 10. So, um, so could you all join me in thanking Claire very much for a really interesting presentation?